Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. This week I'm travelling a little bit further and we are going to India for one of India's most notorious whodunit cases. This week I'm talking about the Noida double murders. The name refers to the murders of 13 year old Arushi Talwa and her family's live-in domestic help. 45 year old Hemraj Banjade who was from Nepal. From what I can tell, this is one of the most famous cases in India. It's quite a controversial one. Everyone has some kind of opinion one way or another. And I generally don't like to cover the controversial cases because people get very sensitive. So I just want to say now before we start, this case is probably one of the most well covered cases I have ever done on this channel. There is so much information about this online. Like the Wikipedia page itself is probably the longest I've ever seen. And I've really tried my hardest to sort of sift through this all and just get to the actual point, get to the important things in the investigation. But of course, this does mean that I am gonna miss things out. There are gonna be some things I don't talk about that maybe I haven't deemed important. Maybe you do think they are important. So, so if there are any things like that, please do feel free to let me know in the comments down below. I've tried my hardest. I'm not gonna be able to please everyone with this case. So it's just so much to talk about. I could honestly film like probably a two or three hour video on this. Um, but of course I can't do that. I'm sorry if that comes across as a little bit of a run. I do try my hardest on this channel to cover both the unknown and the well-known cases. Of course, the well-known cases are the ones that generally get requested and I do like to cover them occasionally. But this does mean that people have strong opinions and I tend to get a lot of hate when I cover the well-known cases. So this is just a little disclaimer. If I don't talk about exactly what you want me to talk about, then just leave a comment down below. You don't need to be rude about it. Just more information the better and I can't talk about every single theory I got loads of backlash in last week's Johnny Gosh video because I didn't talk about every single theory that people have but that's why I say at the end of every single video if you have a theory that I haven't mentioned put it down below maybe it's something that I haven't thought of maybe I've chosen not to include that certain theory for a reason but yeah I just felt like I had to say that because this case is so huge so if I do miss out something that you do important just stick it down below but let's begin talking about the case and we're going to start with a little bit of context about Arushi and her family. So Arushi was born on the 24th of May 1994, making her literally just two weeks older than I am. I always find that really sort of like hits home when I cover a case and they're the same age as me because I think about all the milestones that I've had in my life that Arushi now missed out on. Um, so at the time of her death she was actually 13 years old and she was a student at the Delhi Public School. She was the daughter of two dentists, Dr Rajesh Talwar and Dr Nepal Talwar and they're both really successful dentists, they owned their own clinic in sector 27 of Noida, which is a city in India. Before Arushi was born, the Talwars had gone through five years of IVF in an attempt to conceive. They really struggled to conceive and they wanted their child. And eventually Arushi came along and she was just the light of their lives. The family lived in an apartment in sector 25 of Noida and they lived in the apartment with their domestic help, their live-in domestic help and chef, Hemraj Banjade or Banjade, sorry, it was pronounced differently in different sources that I looked at. Um, Hemraj was 45 years old and he had actually moved to Noida from Nepal, where from what I could gather, he would send money back to his family. And as much as I tried to find out information about Hemraj and his life, it just wasn't online. There is so little known about Hemraj and who he really is because the entire media coverage in this case revolves around Arushi and I think it's really important to remember that two people died, not just one. Arushi was a vibrant young girl, she was really popular at school, she had a thriving social life and she was a very typical 13, nearly 14 year old and she did have a bit of an interest in boys, a sort of like new found interest in boys. Um, and on the 15th of May 2008, Arushi's mother Nepal picks her up from school and the two head back to the apartment. As far as we can tell, this evening was pretty much just like any other for the Talwar family. Hemraj cooked dinner for them and Rajesh was actually dropped home by his driver, Umesh Sharma, at around 9.30pm that night. Um, and the driver actually entered the home and this is important to note because this is the last time anyone outside of the family saw Arushi and Hemraj alive. Weirdly, Hemraj cooked dinner for the entire family that night, but he didn't eat his own dinner, which was found still on the side the next day. 
Um, now, the driver seeing Arushi and Hemraj isn't actually the last proof that we have of Arushi being alive. It's just the last time that somebody outside of the family saw her. That night after dinner, her parents actually decide to give her an early birthday present. This was about nine days before her 14th birthday. And so they give her a present, which was a Sony digital camera. And Arushi was overjoyed with this present. She was so excited to have it. And she starts snapping loads of photos of herself and her parents. Um, and the last photo was actually time stamped at 10 at 10 p.m. and it's a photo of Arushi so this would suggest that she was alive at 10 10. Now it was later noted that several of the photos on this digital camera had been deleted and um, loads of people say this is quite suspicious but it could literally have just been Arushi taking photos oh I don't like that photo of myself I'm going to delete it so it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's gone through a camera and has like deleted odd photos I think Arushi just probably was deleting her selfies. Now, according to the parents, at around 11 p.m., Nepur goes into Arushi's room to turn on the internet router, which is where they kept it. They kept the router in Arushi's room. Um, so when Nepur goes in, said that Arushi was just in there reading a book, happy as anything. Um, and actually, around this time, Rajesh answers a call from the US on the landline, and he surfs the internet for a while afterwards. And the last thing Rajesh did that night was actually check his emails at 11.41 p.m. But the router was actually used for the last time at 12.08 p.m. Suggesting that although he replied to his last email at 11.41, he was like surfing the web until a little bit later. Now around 11 p.m., one of Arushi's friends actually attempts to call her on her mobile, but she doesn't answer. And so her friend attempts to call the landline instead, which also wasn't answered. And then he sends her a text, which was never received by her phone. And now this is strange because according to all of Arushi's friends and her phone records, which were later pulled, it showed that Arushi would be on her phone until like much after midnight, usually until like half 12, 1 a.m at the earliest. So it's very, very odd that she wasn't replying to her text just after midnight. Um, and it was later determined that Arushi and Hemraj both died between 12 and 1 a.m. Arushi's body wasn't discovered until the next morning, which was the 16th of May, 2008. The family had employed a new housemaid about eight days earlier called Bharati Mandal. And Bharati rings their doorbell around 6 a.m. Now, usually Hemraj would be awake at that time and he'd be the one to let her in. But that morning, there was no answer. So she tries again, again no answer, so she tries for a third time. And on the third attempt, Nepur opens the door. So I should probably give you a little bit of context here as to how the apartment was laid out. I'll put a floor plan on the screen now so you can sort of like see how the apartment worked. But the interesting thing here is how the entrance worked because there was actually three separate doors. So there were steps leading up to the first entrance gate, which could be opened by giving it quite a hard push, but it was very, very stiff. And then there was the metal grill door in the middle, and it was sort of like a mesh that so you could see through it and talk through it, um, but it was usually locked. And then there was the innermost door, which was a wooden door, and that was the actual entrance to the apartment. So when Nepal comes to the door, she opens the wooden door, the entrance to the apartment, and Bharati is standing outside the outermost gate. So Bharati tells Nepal that she can't get through this gate and it must have been locked from the outside. And Nepal says that Hemraj must have popped out quickly to get some milk, just wait for him to come back and he'll unlock the gate and let her in. Um, but Bharati asks like, can you just throw me the keys out so I can let myself in? And Nepal says, yeah, that's fine, I'll do that. But, but this basically means that Bharati would have had to like walk back down the steps and like outside the apartment complex so Nepal could throw the keys down out of the window. So whilst Nepal's waiting for Bharati to like walk out of the complex so she can throw the keys, she actually attempts to call Hemraj and she attempts to call him twice. The first time, the call like abruptly cut. So it's like the phone was picked up, although nobody spoke. And then two seconds later, the line just goes dead. And by the second time she goes to call him, it appears that the phone has been switched off. And by the time Bharati gets back to the door, so Nepal throws her the keys and Bharati has to like walk back round. Bharati said the door then opened. She didn't need to unlock it, it just was open. And then the middle door just had a latch on it, so that just be unlatched and then it would open. Um, it's also important to note that between the outermost gate and the inner mesh door was actually the door to Hemraj's room. So Hemraj had a sort of like separate entrance to his quarters and then from his room he also had a direct entrance into the flat as well. Again, it will show you all this on the floor plan. So whilst all this is going on with the keys, Rajesh actually wakes up and he enters the living room and he notices this nearly empty bottle of scotch on the dining room table 
table, which he finds really odd because he knows that he hasn't left that there. He asks Nepal who left the bottle there and then asks her to go and check on Arushi. Now, Arushi's bedroom door actually had a lock on it and this would automatically lock whenever the door closed. This meant that it could only be opened from the inside or if you wanted to get into it from the outside, you had to have a key. Um, and that morning, weirdly enough, the door was open and Arushi never slept with her door open. When they enter the room, they find Arushi lying dead on her bed. Rajesh starts screaming, but apparently Nepal stays silent in shock. And it's at this point that Bharati finally walks into the apartment. And she walks in and finds Rajesh and Nepal crying. Um, and Nepal actually asks her to come into Arushi's room, says to her, like, you need to see this. And she pulls the blanket back that was over Arushi. And it's quite obvious that Arushi's throat has been slit. So there's quite a lot of blood everywhere. And apparently at this point, Nepal just remarks, look what Hemraj has done. And this comes directly from Bharati's testimony that she later made. I think she made it in court, but it may have just been a police interview. Um, and she asks the Talwars if they want her to like continue with her chores. They say no, and so she leaves and goes to her next job. Now at this point, the Talwars, obviously in shock, start to call family and friends and tell them what's happened. But they're not the ones to call the police. A neighbor actually asks the building security guard to be the one to call the police. Now I don't know how this came to be. Maybe the neighbor just immediately said like, don't worry about calling the police, I'll do it. You like deal with your stuff. I'll get the police there. Um, so it is a little bit strange that the parents didn't immediately call them, but there could be reasons as to why this is. Um, and the police arrive at approximately 7.15 a.m. And when the police arrive, there are approximately about 15 people in the living room and a few more people, like seven or eight people in the Talwar's bedroom. And the only room that didn't have people in was Arushi's room. So already, by the time the police had even arrived, the crime scene had kind of already been all trampled over, destroyed by the amount of people that were in attendance. By the early morning as well, all of the local media had heard of what had happened. And so there started to be loads of media congregating outside the apartment building. Now immediately to the police and to the Talwars, Hemraj was the number one suspect. Arushi was dead, Hemraj was nowhere to be found. Both Rajesh and Nepal tell the police separately that Hemraj is the one responsible and they tell the police to stop wasting their time by looking at the crime scene and to just go after Hemraj and they even, even like try to bribe the police, offer the money saying like just stop what you're doing, go find him. Um, and the police, to be honest, for the most part, did agree with their theory that Hemraj was the one who had done this. The general immediate theory was that Hemraj had gotten drunk and he'd been drinking the bottle of scotch that was found on the dining room table. And he goes into Arushi's room, which just happened to be left with the key in the door. And he attempts to sexually assault her. When she resists, he killed her with a kukri, I don't know if that's being pronounced right, which is a traditional Nepali knife. And the police announced a reward of 20,000 rupees for any tips that led to Hemraj's capture. Arushi's body was taken for a post-mortem exam at about 8.30 a.m. Um, and the post-mortem was completed very quickly as by 1 p.m. the body was brought back home to the Talwar's apartment and placed on ice slabs in the Talwar's living room. So literally in the space of about four hours, they've completed this autopsy and taken her body back. And by 4 p.m. that afternoon, the body was taken for cremation. And this is so fast for a post-mortem and a cremation to take place in a case that's so questionable. And I'm honestly surprised that the police allowed it. And the Towers did say that they were given permission by the police to do this. They said that the police told them that they had everything they needed and they wouldn't need the body for any further analysis. Um, the tower said that the body was decomposing really fast and the family elders were pushing for cremation to happen as soon as possible. Now I did try to do some research into this to find the sort of like cultural context, if this was something that was very much the norm in India, if people are cremated or buried that quickly. Um, but honestly, all I could really find was very opposing information. I suppose India's such a big country with so many different people and sort of like different religions as well. I couldn't really pinpoint whether or not this was normal. So if you are Indian and if you can let me know if cremations are usually put through that quickly, then please let me know. Um, Arushi's ashes were actually scattered into the Ganges River the next day as per Hindu custom. And there were well wishers visiting the Tawar's house throughout the day for the next few days, which again is a religious custom, but 
kind of destroying the crime scene there, guys. Arushi's post-mortem showed that she had died between 12am and 1am, as she'd been first attacked with a heavy, blunt object, and she'd been hit across the forehead above her left eye. And this caused a deep cut and a blood clot to her brain. Now, this would have been what caused her death. The fact that she had a throat slit, that wasn't her cause of death. The cause of death was this really, really heavy object hitting her around the head. And then like I said, her throat was slit right across. Um, and there was no arterial spurting which showed that it was the hit across the head that killed her and not this. The post-mortem marked that there was nothing abnormal detected in her genital region, thus ruling out sexual assault. She hadn't been raped, although this would later be thrown into question. But as far as I could tell, I don't think she was raped. I mean, later in the investigation, this is thrown into question. There are some doctors who say that they think she was raped, um, but the general consensus is that she wasn't. Um, and although, strangely, she hadn't been raped, there was evidence to suggest that her genitals had been cleaned after she died, which is just very, very odd. And it's not thought that either weapon has ever been found, but again, there is question around that. Like I said, this case has so many little nuances. There is basically a theory that the blunt object used to hit Arushi around the head could have potentially been one of Rajesh's golf clubs. A lot of people think this is true, a lot of people again say that they don't think it was a golf club. Um, and they're not sure what the sharp weapon used to slit the throat was. They flip between this sharp object being a surgical knife and a kukri, which is the Nepali knife I mentioned previously. So when Arushi was found, she was found lying on her bed, covered with a white flannel blanket. Her face was covered, weirdly enough, by her school bag. There was blood on the pillow, the bed, walls, floor, and the front side of the bedroom door. However, strangely enough, there was no blood on the toys, school bag, or pillow, which would lead the investigators to believe that the entire scene had been staged. So they'd killed her, basically, and then tried to cover things up a little bit. The Talwar's domestic help soon clean up the entire apartment apartment and crime scene, including Arushi's bedroom. Um, and they later told the police that they were given permission by the police to do so. The police said that they could clean up. Um, but again, it just seems very fast to want to clean up a crime scene. It's very, very weird. Um, a part of Arushi's mattress was actually sent to a forensics lab for testing, as well as her pillow, bed sheets, and clothing. Um, and the police were actually going to dump the rest of the mattress on the terrace um, just to get it out of the way. It was all bloodstained and a little bit gross. Um, but the terrace was actually locked and they didn't really try any harder to get up there. They just all like saw it was locked. And so actually put the mattress on a different terrace of a neighbouring house. It's important to remember that they did this because they would later find bloodstains leading up the stairs to the terrace. Um, but because they tried to drag this bloodstained mattress up there, they don't actually know if it was the mattress that caused these bloodstains or something else. Um, investigators found a number of bloodstains across the entire house, including blood on the scotch bottle that was found on the table, and there was blood on the handle to the terrace door, which people would have noticed when they tried to get up there to put the mattress up there, um, but no further action was made at the time. Um, eventually, the police were persuaded to look at the terrace, but they, it was locked, they didn't have the key. Um, there's conflicting reports, but apparently the police asked Rajesh for the key to the terrace, and Rajesh just never really gave it to them. He kept making excuses that he couldn't find it, and so the police just didn't push it any further. Now, one of the well-wishers who arrived at the Tawar's house the following day was actually a retired police officer called K.K. Gautam, or Gautam. And um, when he's arrived, he's actually greeted by Dinesh Talwar, who is Rajesh's brother. Rajesh and Nepal had actually gone out to spread Arushi's ashes. Um, and so Dinesh was the one sort of like managing the home whilst the parents were out. Now, Gautam actually examines Arushi and Hemraj's rooms, like he's a retired police officer, and he's shown the blood on the locked door, on the handle for the terrace. And Gautam actually makes a call to the police and says, like, listen, you need to get that door unlocked. It's pretty important. I don't care if you need to break the lock to do it. Just, like, get up on the terrace. Um, and they actually continue searching for the lost key, and they even go and ask the neighbours if they had a key. Nobody did. Um, ultimately, the door had to be broken open by the police, and as soon as they enter the terrace, they see blood marks, as if a body has been dragged. And then they find another body. This body was in the advanced stages of putrefaction. This was India in May, and the sun is very, very hot. So you can imagine that a body would decompose very, very quickly. And the body was discovered lying in a pool of blood at 10.30am that day. 
Now the body couldn't immediately be identified by Dinesh and Dinesh actually calls Rajesh and Nepal and asks him to come home straight away. And so they come home, Nepal stays in the car with Arushi's ashes and Rajesh goes up to the terrace and he actually tells the police that he can't identify the body. Which is a little bit strange because no, Hemraj lives with them, you'd think he'd be able to identify him, but then you've got to bear in mind the advanced stages of decomposition that the body was in. So again, 50-50 on that one. But as you can probably guess, the body was later confirmed to be that of Hemraj, and his autopsy was conducted later that day, and his injuries were very, very similar to Arushi's. He was also killed by a blunt force injury, this time to the back of the head, and he had identical cuts on his neck. I say cuts, just one cut, his throat had been slit again. Um, Hemraj's body had been dragged at least 20 feet across the terrace after his dead, shown by the blood trail and the abrasions that was found on his arms. He had been left on the terrace, his body kind of like propped up against an AC unit. And his body had actually been covered with a panel found on the roof. So somebody had gone to the effort of like trying to hide his body. I mean, he couldn't easily be seen from neighboring terraces. So nobody was gonna see him. I was originally thought that he'd actually been murdered somewhere else and dragged to the terrace, like shown by the blood stains on the stairs. But when they later realized that the blood on the stairs likely didn't come from Hemraj, they figured that he was most likely killed on the terrace and his blood wasn't found anywhere in the apartment. A bloody palm print was found on the terrace wall in what was confirmed to be Hemraj's blood, but they were unable to identify whose palm print actually was. And alongside this, they found a shoe print as well in the blood, um, which was a size eight or nine shoe. Little care was taken with Hemraj's body as they removed it from the terrace. They literally just wrapped it in a bed sheet and dragged it down the stairs, which may have affected the post-mortem in some way, I'm sure. Um, but obviously the discovery of Hemraj's body threw a huge spanner in the works for the police's investigation. I mean, he obviously didn't murder Arushi if he was dead as well. At the end of May, the Central Bureau of Investigation of India takes over the case from the local police. So this has like reached like huge, huge levels in India. Um, some of Hemraj's friends actually come forward and they say that Hemraj told them that he feared for his life and that he fe also feared for the lives of some of his nearest and dearest. Um, but it seems that he didn't give them any more information than this, which I find a little bit strange because if somebody comes up to you and they say like, I'm scared for my life, you tend to ask why? Um, but it doesn't look like Hemraj like expanded on this at all. March 2011, so like three years after murders, Hemraj's wife actually came from Nepal to India for the first time. Her name was Kamkala. Um, and Kamkala actually said that she suspected that the Talwars had something to do with it because Hemraj loved Arushi like his own daughter. He got on with her really, really well, but his relationship with Rajesh was really strange, who he described as short-tempered. Now, according to his wife, the Talwars actually suspected Hemraj of leaking their family secrets. Um, and Nepal, Rajesh, and Dinesh, Rajesh's brother, had actually threatened to kill him. And apparently at the time of the murder, Hemraj was looking for a new job, um, which is what his wife said years later, but we can't really confirm if any of this is true. Um, but there are two main questions in this which affect the entire direction of the inquiry. You can probably already guess the kind of direction this is about to go in. The parents were looking very, very suspicious. And there are a lot of main questions in this investigation that I'm going to sort of like talk about now. Um, the first thing is there was no sign of forced entry into the apartment. Whoever did this was likely already in the apartment or had easy access to it or everything happened to be left unlocked on that particular night. Now, Nepal said that morning when she threw the keys down to Bharati, the maid, she would actually usually have thrown down Hemraj's keys, which were always kept on the side. But that morning, she couldn't find Hemraj's keys, and so she throws down her own. But the strangest thing is, Bharati couldn't open the gate first thing in the morning, which is why she had to get the keys. But when she came back upstairs, the gate opened easily. Now, this could be explained by the fact the gate was pretty stiff, you had to push very hard to open it, and Bharati was new and maybe she didn't realise this. Um, but again, maybe it was locked. One of the theories is that before Nepal went to throw the keys to Bharati, she, she actually popped out of the house through Hemraj's servant quarters, unlocked the door, and then went back in and threw the keys down. So when Bharati went round again, it was miraculously unlocked. 
And it's also really strange that Rushi's bedroom door was open that morning as well, because that would usually be locked. Rushi would sleep with her door closed and it would be locked every single night. But Nepal, like I said earlier, had actually gone into the room at 11pm the night before because she needed to turn on the internet. She said that it's likely that when she left the room, she actually accidentally left the key in the door. So even though she would have closed the door, the key was still in there and so anybody could have got in the room. The key to Arushi's bedroom was actually found on top of a sculpture near the front door, which Nepal said like she wouldn't have put it there. That wouldn't have been put there by her. She usually slept with Arushi's key on her bedside table. And it's also really interesting to have a look at the phone records in this case because I think they say a lot. Now both Arushi and Hemraj's phones disappeared from the crime scenes, although Arushi's was later found. So the last call made to Hemraj's phone whilst it was known he was still alive was actually at 8.27pm the night before, um, which lasted about six minutes. And this call came from a public telephone about a kilometre away from the apartment. They were able to trace which public telephone it was, but they've never been able to find out who it was he was talking to. And then obviously the next two calls were the two calls from Nepal the next morning. The first of which was picked up and disconnected two seconds later, and the second didn't connect. Now this particular call was picked up on a cell tower that would have covered the tower's apartment. And this suggests that Hemraj's phone was still in the vicinity when Nepal made this call. We've already briefly talked about Arushi's phone usage before her death, but I just want to touch on this again. So like I mentioned earlier, she'd usually be on her phone until well after midnight talking to her friends via text and phone calls. But on the night of the 15th, the phone was actually inactive after 9.10pm, which is so, so early when you look at how late she was using her phone every night previously. And we know she didn't go to sleep at 9.10pm. Her friend sent her a text at 12.30am and this text was never received by her phone. So either the battery had died or the phone had been switched off. But if the battery had died, why would she not have plugged it in and charged it up again? And also we're talking about an old school phone here. The phone that Rishi had was a Nokia N72, which was technically classed actually at the time as a smartphone, but it's not the kind of smartphone that you picture today. These old Nokia phones, these quite brickish style phones the batteries were good like they would last multiple days i mean i remember the phone that i had around this age and obviously me and arushi would be the same age and i wouldn't have to charge it for like three or four days the battery would last for so long so it just seems very odd that arushi's phone battery would die at 9 p.m on that day and first of all she wouldn't bother to recharge it but also that she just happened to end up dead later that night Basically what I'm trying to say is I think it's more likely that the phone was switched off and not that the battery had died. In the few days before her murder, Arushi had actually had 680 separate phone transactions, both calls and texts, with one particular person, her friend Anmol. And Anmol was the one who tried to call her after midnight that night, the one who sent her a text but was never received. Her and Anmol were talking loads. Now a few days after her death, Arushi's phone is actually found on a dirt track near the Sadapur area of Noida, which according to Google Maps is about an hour's walk or a 13 minute drive away from the apartment. Now this phone was actually found by a housemaid who gave the phone to her brother and he sort of just holds on to the phone for a little bit and actually the next year, so I think it was around January 2009, he actually gets a SIM and starts using this phone for the first time. By, by September 2009 the police are able to use the phone signal and trace it back to this particular residence where they obviously arrest the guy because he's got a dead girl's phone but it was later proven that his sister had just found the phone on a dirt track. They had no idea it was anything to do with this huge murder investigation and neither of them had really done anything wrong. But obviously the police seized the phone, they looked into it and they found absolutely nothing of any use on there. There was slightly unusual usage on the Talwar's landline that night as well. Rishi's friend Amal, who I just mentioned, tried to call the landline at about 11.34 um, no answer, then he tries to call again around midnight as he couldn't get hold of Arushi on her mobile and again there's no answer but the Tawa said they had no knowledge of either of these calls, they don't remember the phone ringing at all uh, but they said that Arushi would sometimes turn the ringer off on the phone so she could like answer the phone to her friends and not have her parents be annoyed about it. Um, and Rajesh's phone also seems to show pretty usual usage on the night of the murders. His last call was at 11.01pm to Chicago 
So his phone just seems totally normal. Nepal's phone, however, shows a bit strange usage. Um, her phone was actually switched off at 7.40pm on the 15th of May, and it wasn't turned on again until 1pm on the 18th of May, which is very, very strange because in the two months previous to this, she hadn't turned her phone off once. Rajesh and Nepal became the number one suspects in Arushi and Hemraj's murders. But this wasn't where the police went straight out. I mean, they did pretty much immediately start to suspect the parents, um, but they actually first looked at a former servant of the Talwar family. Now, this man was called Vishnu Sharma. Now, Vishnu had worked for the family for 10 years. Vishnu, I think, was from Nepal, and so he'd often go off on long holidays back to his homeland to visit his family. But whenever he'd go away on these holidays, he would always find a replacement for the family, so he wasn't leaving them high and dry. And so he'd always go away, give them a replacement, and when he came back, the replacement would obviously leave. However, one time Vishnu went away and he found Hemraj as his replacement. But when Vishnu got back off holiday, the Talwars actually told him that they preferred Hemraj and that they would be keeping him on. And so Vishnu, was out of a job. I mean, this is as good a motive as any for murder. However, it was later proven that Vishnu was in Nepal at the time of the murders, and so he couldn't possibly have done this. Once that was out of the way, the Talwars were pretty much the only people the police were looking at. By May 23rd, Rajesh is arrested. And to me, it just seems like the police were very desperate to pin this murder on someone. They were under the media spotlight. They had all of this pressure on them. This was a huge, huge case. And the country wanted to know who had done this. So they were quick to cast blame and aspersions and just make arrests. And they wanted it to look like they were doing their jobs properly. And I'm not saying there was no basis in arresting Rajesh at all. He's definitely made some questionable actions. But I think the police just moved too quickly. They moved so, so fast in this that they didn't ever really build up a proper amount of evidence here. They just wanted to arrest someone. This leads us to the most popular theory in this case, which kind of revolves around the entire idea of honour killings. I'm sure that most of you know what honour killings are, but just for those of you who are potentially unsure, the basic definition of an honour killing is the murder of a member of a family due to the perpetrator's beliefs that their actions have brought some kind of shame or dishonour on the family. Um, this shame can be for a number of reasons, usually stemming from religious beliefs. It could be divorce, refusal to enter an arranged marriage, a disproving relationship, sex outside of marriage, homosexuality, among other things. It's just the idea that someone brings shame on a family and so somebody in the family murders them. This stems from a theory that Hemraj and Arushi were actually lovers, which seeing as Arushi was just 13 years old would make Hemraj a paedophile as well as an adulterer. Um, the rumour goes that the two of them were discovered in a compromising situation by Rajesh and then goes on to kill them both in a fit of rage. The media love this theory, they really latched onto it, it sort of had everything that sold a good story, love, sex, murder, um, but there was actually very little basis in it. A second favourite theory suggested that Rajesh was the one having the affair and that Hemraj knew about it and was blackmailing him so he would stay quiet. Rajesh snaps one day and kills Hemraj, but Arushi bears witness to this, and so Rajesh has to kill his own daughter as well. Nepal helps him cover up the crime, or potentially it could have been the other way around. Arushi knew about the affair, and so Rajesh kills Arushi, and then Hemraj saw it. Either way, the basis is there. Um, according to the police's line of inquiry, it was both of these theories. They said that Rajesh was having an affair with a woman named Anita Durrani, who was a fellow doctor who worked at the same clinic as the Talwars. And they said that Arushi knew all of this. And then when Rajesh comes home that night, apparently he finds Arushi and Hemraj in a compromising situation. So just with everything, with Arushi knowing about the affair and, and with Hemraj and Arushi in a compromising situation, Rajesh decides it's probably best to kill them. The police claim that Rajesh took Hemraj out onto the terrace to sort out the issue and killed him again in a fit of rage, smashing Hemraj's head in with a hammer and then slitting his throat with a surgical knife he had in his pocket. Rajesh then goes downstairs and has a couple of drinks, which is why there was an alcohol bottle on the table, and then goes into Arushi's room and murders her as well. I mean, regardless of whether you believe the story or not, regardless of whether you think it's true, there's no denying that the police and the CBI did everything they could to make the storyline fit the way they wanted the narrative to go. 
They claim that Rajesh confessed to the crime and that the friend that Rushi was talking to over the previous days was actually her confidant that Rushi had been talking to her friend Anmol about her father's affair and that's why they've been talking so much. Um, they seized Rajesh's laptop and Arushi's hard drive to her computer and they found a load of emails and they said these emails showed a difficult relationship between the two. They said they contained questionable content. Obviously as far as I could find they didn't release all of the emails. The only ones I could find um, was an email from Arushi to her father that said I just wanted to try it out because I heard from my friends so what's the harm? I want to do it again and I kind of know how you're feeling but we don't have any context behind this. I don't know what it is Arushi tried because she heard it from her friends. I mean she was 13 years old it could have been literally anything um but there's later an email to her dad that says i love hanging around with you guys thanks for everything but one time a smile will show up forever thank you mum and dad take care um now these emails they, they kind of made out they were really recent emails but they're actually about a year old um and the police use these as part of their storyline here a huge character assassination on every member of the Talwa family. They kind of made it seem like Arushi was promiscuous, that she was sexually involved with all of these boys. They basically said that because she was showing to have regular text contact with three different boys and she was basically a bit of a slut. Um, but shock horror, it's not that strange for a 13, nearly 14 year old to show a little bit of interest in boys. There's no evidence that she was sleeping with any of these boys. She was just texting them, same as any 13, 14 year olds today snapchats boys from their class it's not necessarily anything bad i mean i've said it already but it just seems like the police were sort of pushing it to where they wanted it to go and not where it actually went honestly i don't really see how those emails can be used as proof of anything whatsoever it doesn't show anything wrong to me it shows that arushi's probably done something wrong that her parents haven't approved of and so they're actually having quite a healthy conversation about it i mean so many 13 year olds wouldn't have a conversation with their parents about them something like that but arushi was emailing her dad about it and like saying i love you guys i want to try it i'll do it again but i just wanted to do it because my friends were doing it that shows like a healthy discourse a healthy conversation so i'm not really sure what the police are getting out with that i don't know if i've missed a bit of context um but everyone online was saying that, that sort of like was part of the police's storyline here to show arushi was like a really bad child but i don't know and also why are they trying to make the victim out to be the bad one here why are they trying to push this viewpoint of arushi being a really promiscuous teenager when that doesn't have anything to do with anything she was murdered as far as I can tell, they never found any solid proof of Rajesh actually having an affair either. He always completely denied it, but obviously I can't be 100% sure on that. I'm not sure if maybe he did have an affair, he's just always denied it, I'm not really sure. Um, less did they find proof that Rushi knew of this affair that may or may not have happened. And even less than that, there was no proof of Rushi and Hemraj ever having any kind of relationship either. Hemraj, like his wife said, viewed Rushi as a daughter. And also she was very very young there just seems to be a huge lack of an actual investigation here it's more the police like finding things that fit what they want it to fit and they're not actually looking at the entire picture uh, but let's just round up all of the evidence used against the parents at this point um, and just to clarify the finger was mainly being pointed at Rajesh as being the culprit like Rajesh committed the murders and the poor just was an accessory to the crime helped him cover it up. So the main things used to point to the Talwar's potential guilt was that there was no evidence of any kind of break-in. It looked like an inside job. They would have had to have slept through the murders when their room is basically next to Arushi's. Again I'll put up the floor plan so you can see how the rooms were laid out. How could they not hear something going on in there? The crime scene had been dressed, Arushi's things had been moved around, it looked like somebody was trying to hide the murder. But if somebody was breaking in, why would they bother to hide the murder? The police repeatedly requested that Rajesh gave them the key to the terrace and he just didn't. Um, the general weird circumstances with all the locked doors is a whole thing. Um, they were very, very quick to cremate Arushi's body and clean up the crime scene. And just the general lack of there being no other suspects as well led to the police to believe it must have been the parents. But all of this is just circumstantial. There was no actual evidence. 
Um, and the Talbots did have their counter arguments for each and every point. They stated that the AC units in each of the rooms would have disguised any sort of sounds. The AC units were very, very loud and there was actually an experiment done and it was proven that they may not have heard anything. And also their beds weren't really like close. So the parents' bed was like this side and Arushi's bed was like here. So they weren't exactly like headboard to headboards. And also whoever attacked Arushi would have just broken into her room and hit her in her forehead very quickly before likely she even had a chance to like sit up in bed. So it's likely that Arushi would have made no noise whatsoever. They claimed that they didn't dress the crime scene, whoever did it wasn't them, because why would they leave a whiskey bottle with blood on the table? If they went to all of the effort, why would they leave that whiskey bottle there? They said they both cleaned the house and cremated Arushi's body after getting permission from the police. Paul also said that she likely just accidentally left Arushi's key in her door the previous night when she went to turn on the internet. Um, and Rajesh claims that he has no memories of anyone asking them for the terrace key. Maybe they did, but he said he was grieving and so he just wasn't thinking straight. But also, importantly, there was a shoe print in blood on the roof. Possibly one of the biggest pieces of evidence in this case. It showed that whoever did this was likely a shoe size 8 or 9. Rajesh was a 6. But there were other potential suspects as well. Now bear with me on this, I hope that I'm going to be able to make this all make sense. So according to the Talwars, a large amount of the police's storyline was actually planted to the police by an assistant at the dental clinic, a man called Krishna Thadari. And Rajesh actually had to reprimand Krishna a couple of days before because he'd made a mistake, which was quite a big mistake. And so Rajesh had to like tell him off. But apparently Krishna was really embarrassed by this. Um, and Rajesh's driver actually stated that he'd heard Hemraj and Krishna talk in his car in Nepalese and Krishna said that he would deal with Rajesh. This Krishna guy was later detained by the police. On searching his house, they actually find a pillow cover. Um, Arushi's, I think, was missing, although again, that is questionable, um, along with a bloodstained cookery. I'm not sure how, but it seems I've lost a little bit of footage here, so I just want to say that Krishna was obviously subjected to a polygraph test as well as a narco analysis test. Narco analysis tests are when the person is given what I can only describe as truth serum. This is what people mean when they talk about like truth serum tests. But it's actually a substance that they're injected with called sodium pentothal or sodium amital. Basically when you're injected with this it makes you more relaxed, it sort of sends you into like a sleepy kind of state. I mean I'm like obviously very much putting this into layman's terms. But it basically makes you more susceptible to telling the truth because your guards are down. Honestly it's a very questionable test. I wouldn't take anything that's said in a truth serum test as gospel. Apparently during the test Krishna negatived both theories. The theory that Arushi was of bad character, victim blaming anyone, and that she was involved with Hemraj. And he also apparently said that Rajesh was innocent. Um, again, these tests are questionable. Um, Krishna apparently confesses to everything. He speaks about how, when and where the murder occurred. And he also speaks of a second murderer being involved, although he doesn't say a particular name. And this leads the police to go out and look for who else could be involved in this thing. And the CBI then begin suspecting a friend of Krishna's called Rajkuma, who was actually the domestic servant of Anita Durrani, the person that Rajesh was accused of having an affair with. I hope you're staying with me here. Rajkuma is also eventually arrested and he's subjected to polygraph tests and a narco analysis test. And the CBI sees a load of things from his house, including washed t-shirts with faint human blood on it. But the Duralis actually said that Rajkuma had a lot of like boils on his body and the blood was probably just from his own boils on his body, which is a little bit gross. Um, and then comes the third member of this apparently murderous group, Vijay Mandal, who was another friend of Krishna's. Um, and Vijay's arrested on the 11th of July. And pretty much all of these arrests were based on the narco analysis tests of Krishna. Um, and they're just very questionable to say the least. Each person was subjected to their own narco analysis test. And each person, to be fair, said a very similar story. Um, but little details changed in each. And I do find this quite telling that each one of the three was arrested separately and they all kind of told the same story, just little details change. Um, according to the CBI, this is the possible sequence of events following the narco analysis tests. Um, so apparently Hemraj invites Krishna, Rajkuma and Vijay to his servants quarters at the Talwar's house. They're all friends, they all know each other. 
Um, and apparently the three arrive at the Talwar's house around midnight. Now according to Raj Kumar's test, BJ was there, but BJ had no part in the actual murders. Um, so the four of them are in Hemraj's room and they begin to drink. Three glasses were actually found in Hemraj's room. Two of these glasses contained liquor apparently, and the other one was empty alongside three bottles. One bottle was Kingfisher beer, one bottle had Sprite, and the other bottle had whiskey in. Apparently Hemraj's DNA was found on the Kingfisher beer bottle, but Hemraj was apparently actually teetotal, so this is a little bit strange. So apparently they're all sitting in the room, getting a little bit drunk, and Krishna begins to talk about Rajesh, and is saying how Rajesh basically treated him like dirt at work the other day and told him off and embarrassed him in front of everyone. Then maybe Hemraj starts speaking, starts saying like, yeah, he doesn't treat me the best either. And they're all angry, they're drunk, and so apparently they sneak into Arushi's room, which just happened to be left unlocked. Now this is when each version of the story differs slightly. And the general gist is that Rajkuma entered Arushi's room first and attempts to sexually assault her. When Arushi obviously resists, Krishna pulls out a kukri and kills her. Hemraj protests this, obviously he's mad at Rajesh, but he doesn't want Arushi killed and he threatens to make a scene. So they all go up onto the terrace where they kill Hemraj. Um, the day all of this comes out, Rajesh is released from prison after 50 days due to a lack of evidence. You'd think they would have realised there was a lack of evidence before they arrested him, but never mind. But the police didn't care anymore because now they had their new suspects. They didn't care who was in jail for the murders. I don't think they cared if they had the right person. They just had to have someone. Um, the three suspects are all arrested, but they can't be charged on the narco analysis alone. It's inadmissible in court. There's no actual evidence that any of them had anything to do with it. Um, they also had a pretty decent defence. They all had alibis. Um, even though when under the narco analysis they all told these stories, when they were actually like sober, I suppose for want of a better word, they pretty much denied it. They all had alibis. Um, their families or employers said they were at home at the time. And there are also six security guards at the Talwar's apartment complex at this time. And not one of the six people said they saw anyone go in or out of the Talwar's apartment that night. But the security guards were like the on foot ones who would like walk around the complex. So it, there is a chance that they just wouldn't have been seen. In the narco analysis report as well, one of them said I couldn't figure out which one that said that Rushi's mobile was actually sent to Nepal. Obviously at this point Rushi's phone hadn't been found. But obviously when Arushi's phone was found to be in India about a year later, that throws the entire statement into question. Basically, they all turned around and said it was just all completely coerced. They are all like in a vulnerable state and the police were pushing them to say particular things. They tortured them until they told them what they wanted. But the biggest offence they possibly could have had was that there was no DNA or fingerprint evidence of them ever being in the Talwar's apartment. There was nothing to show that any of them were there. And the bloodstained kukri that I mentioned earlier that was found in Krishna's apartment, it wasn't ever shown to actually be human blood and they couldn't ever extract any DNA from it to sort of show whose blood it was. So basically, it's all back to square one. They try to file charges against the three men, but they just don't have the evidence. The courts won't allow them to file charges against them. Uh, but the CBI weren't about to give up. They spend the next couple of years analysing and reanalyzing all of the evidence in the case over and over and over again. And on the 29th of December 2010, they file a closure report naming Rajesh Talwa as the number one suspect. The CBI argued that the evidence only pointed to the Talwars being involved. The scene had been staged and why would a random criminal go to the effort of staging the scene? Why would anyone care how the bodies were found apart from the parents? The thought is that Rajesh put Hemraj on the roof intending to later dispose of the body but when the case became so big and there was so much media and police attention on them all the time he couldn't get rid of the body so he just put off giving them the terrorist key. The cuts on the necks were apparently done with surgical precision and the Talwars were doctors, albeit dentists they were doctors, they had medical training. Plus all of the evidence I mentioned earlier, I'm not gonna go back into it. Um, but there was still actually no clear evidence that the parents had anything to do with it. There was just lack of a clear motive. It was just gossip and rumors. And although Rajesh was named as the sole suspect, they still didn't have any evidence to actually arrest him. But by February 2011, the CBI had everything they needed and Rajesh and Nepal were arrested and the formal trial begins on the 11th of May 2013. 
Now in court, the Talwars asked for DNA testing to be done to analyse the bloody palm print on the terrace, as well as the still unidentified fingerprints on the whiskey bottle and on the golf club that was rumoured to be the murder weapon. But the court refused to do any further investigation. But this does beg the question, why would the court refuse to do this? And why would the Talwars ask for more investigation into things that could potentially show them to be guilty if they are guilty. On the 25th of November 2013 both Rajesh and Nepal are found guilty for the two murders and they're convicted of murder, destruction of evidence and misleading the probe. They're sentenced each to life imprisonment. Um, but in January 2014 Tawaz challenged the decision and by the 12th of October 2017 the High Court acquits them of all charges they say that the evidence wasn't satisfactory beyond reasonable doubt, and so the Talwars are let free. It was basically a trial by media, is what the High Court said. They said that the media convicted the parents, and so the court did as well. And really, they shouldn't have, because there still wasn't any solid evidence. And that's pretty much it up until now. I mean, it seems like there's still arguments going on behind the scene. I don't think Rajesh and Nepal are out of the woods yet. I think... I mean, the CBI could still come for them. I really do struggle with this case. There's so many inconsistencies in the evidence. I find it difficult to say that the Talwars had anything to do with their daughter and Hemraj's murder. But I also struggle with the fact that there was no sign of any break-in. There was no DNA evidence from anyone else. The thought of Hemraj having a guest in his servants' quarters and that guest going on to do this is the only other explanation I can possibly think of here. I'm genuinely not convinced either way in this case. I don't have any really strong opinion. I have no idea where I stand and I've been reading about this case for weeks now. I just could not tell you if the parents did it or not. But I don't trust that the police did a proper job with this case. I think they were on such a one-track mind that they easily could have missed other pieces of evidence. I mean, the crime scene was cleaned up so quickly, the post-mortem was done so quickly and her body was destroyed. I mean, surely you'd keep her body just in case. I am so intrigued to hear what you guys are going to think about this case. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I haven't included every single theory out there, but I think I've included the most relevant ones. And I'll let you guys come up with your own theories from here. So make sure you put all of your comments down below. Um, let me know if there's any other cases you want me to cover. I really want to challenge myself at the moment by covering as many foreign cases as I can. So please let me know and I will see you next week. Goodbye.